embrace is this, but we can turn it into images. None of what you hear, half of what you see. Make it out here, I'm not the voice to be Hey, good morning, everybody. I hope you guys are having a good day. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World and the Black Business School. And um, I am uh, I'm actually getting set up to uh, get ready to talk to you guys. I have to um, I got to twist some stuff in here, my little tripod. Uh, but uh, anyway, do me a favor. As you come in, please hit the thumbs up button, hit the share button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't done it yet. Also, make sure you subscribe to the Black Financial Channel. That's theblackfinancialchannel.com. That's where we give daily financial news and commentary from a black perspective. Uh, you guys know my PhD is in finance, so I love and I love teaching black people. So, um, so join us at theblackfinancialchannel.com. Uh, that is a great place for you to get involved in important financial conversations that affect your community. Uh, now, speaking of financial conversations, I want to ask you guys, uh, do you know uh, of a brother by the name of Michael Eric Dyson? Uh, do you know Michael Eric Dyson? Give me a yes or no in the chat if you know who Michael Eric Dyson is. I'm going to make the assumption that a lot of you do know who he is, but I'm not going to assume that everybody knows who he is. Uh, Michael Eric Dyson is a professor of sociology, if I'm not mistaken, at Georgetown University. Uh, I think he's a smart guy. Um, I really do. Um, also, uh, I consider him to be one of the originals in terms of uh, one of the first uh, black public intellectuals. They, they got out there and really started uh, engaging the public, which I, I've always felt that academics should always do this. Um, I think that the fact that you don't have uh, enough uh, academics out here connected with the public, that's one of the challenges the black community has, I, I believe, that uh, a lot of our scholars have abandoned the community, don't even talk to black people. They just sit in academia and write a bunch of research papers that nobody ever reads. And, um, and that wasn't something that was of interest to me. I did get a PhD and I was in academia and I published a lot of, you know, peer reviewed publications. But I remember thinking this isn't going to help black people. This isn't going to solve my problem that we have as, as, as a community. So uh, I immediately sort of peeped out this idea that, you know, I was engaged in this massive exercise of extreme nothingness uh, that wasn't going to benefit anybody. So uh, long story short, um, I, I bounced out of uh, Syracuse University where I used to teach and uh, chose a different path, you know, and uh, Dyson, I'm like, his path isn't the same as mine, right? Dyson, uh, you know, he, he uh, he's in a different space, but, you know, he does what he does and he does it the way he does it. And that's just what it is. Now, with that said, though, um, uh, Dyson uh, made some comments about reparations that um, I, I could tell a lot of people had issues with his comments. Um, I, I shared it on the page. Did anybody here give me a yes or no if you heard uh, Dyson mentioned his uh, individual reparations account. Anybody hear about that? Uh, where he was talking about his individual reparations account with the New York Times. Um, and I'm going to read some of this to you so you guys can kind of hear it and give me your thoughts. Uh, hit the thumbs up button while I pull this out. Please hit the thumbs up button and the notification bell so you'll be notified when we go live. He gives a sermon and he says at the end of your sermon, you do a benediction section in which you talk about making reparations on the local and individual level. Donating to groups like the like the United Negro College Fund or scholarship program, but also to cite your example from the book, paying, quote, the black person who cut your grass, what uh, double what you might normally pay. So so he's basically making an argument that says, you know, one type of reparations we could do uh, would be to allow whites to have individual reparations accounts uh, like an IRA where they can um, do little things for black people that they know for their black friends. Uh, maybe tip the waitress, uh, you know, 25 percent instead of 20 percent, uh, pay the, you know, the guy who cut your grass double. Um, it, it really was kind of, a, you know, it, it, it was very, very strange to hear that. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't know where the idea came from, but I can say this, um, you know, I, I keep a pulse on the community in terms of what people think uh, on my uh, on my page. On my YouTube channel, we have a little blog where I can share articles and ideas, and I put it up there, and I can tell you guys we're not feeling that. A lot of you responded pretty strongly, uh, really to the point where there are some people who are even mad at me for even putting Dyson's idea on the page. Like, Dr. Boyce, you're supposed to be woke, man. You're supposed to be woke. Why are you, you, supposed to be, why are you putting this bullshit on your page, man? I'm starting to think you're a fraud, Dr. Boyce. You're a fraud because you put this up. Negro, calm down. Take your Ritalin, son. Take your Ritalin. Get it. He needs a nap. Never go off because somebody shared an idea with you that you disagree with. Just say, I disagree, and here's why. You ain't got to cancel everybody just because they say something that don't make no sense. Like that, That's kind of 
weird. That's a little bit over the top, if you ask me. But you know, but but I think it's okay to also be to critique an idea, and, and which is what um, I'd like to do. You know, and so so I'm reading the New York Times article with Michael Eric Dyson, where he's talking about these individual reparations accounts, and he says, um, "Good when the guy says that that idea gave me pause." this idea of paying the black person double to cut your grass as a type of reparations or making a donation to the United Negro College Fund uh, as a type of reparations. Uh, he, she, the, the, the New York Times a reporter that interviews him says, that gave me pause. And he says, good, I used to say in church, if the sermon ain't making you a little bit uncomfortable, it ain't effective. Look, if it doesn't cost you anything, you're not really engaging in change. You're engaging in convenience. You're engaged in the overflow. I'm asking you to do stuff you would normally do, ordinarily do. I'm asking you to do more, to, to think more seriously and strategically about why you possess what you possess. Okay. Um, then the reporter says to Dyson, he says, um, I agree with reparations, but maybe this is my white privilege speaking. I just can't imagine do, actually doing that. And then Dyson says, this is what I meant by an IRA, an individual reparations account. You ain't got to ask the government. You don't have to ask your local politician. This is what you, an individual, conscientious, woke citizen, can do. And so then he says, uh, the reporter says, which is correct, but charity can't be the end of it, right? The Colt brothers gave the United Negro College Fund $25 million, but I doubt you would consider them woke. And then he says, no, Martin Luther King Jr. believed that charity is a poor substitute for justice, but I ain't turning $25 million down. Really interesting. What do you guys think? Yo, know, a uh, good idea or BS? Give me, give me, answer me in the chat. And also hit the thumbs up button. Good idea or BS? I'd like to get your take uh, in, in, the, in the chat. Do you think that Dyson's idea makes sense or do you think it's a bunch of BS? Good idea, BS. Let me see. How, how you doing, Sonia and Marsha? Um, and Trey, Federal Reserve mandate is the issue. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um, Brian says BS. Elvin says House Negro telling the field Negro it's okay to take a handout. Uh, Cl uh, Cluckus says BS. Versal City says bull. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of BSs. The B. It looks like BS wins the election in a landslide. Uh, I have not seen anybody say this is a good idea. Uh, Dre Day says I like Dyson, but BS. Okay, so um, you know. Michael Eric Dyson, I, I consider him to be a guy that I would that I would look at as a friend. Um, I ain't talked to him in probably four years, but uh, I don't hate the guy. I'm just gonna say this: I, he's he's never been mean to me. I've, every time I met him, he's always been uh, a decent human being. And uh, actually, to give him full credit, the reason that I cannot go totally in on a guy like Dyson is because without Dyson, there would be no me. Um, the same way I give credit to Dr. Claude Anderson, even when I disagree with him. Um, Dyson is actually one of the first. He's the first public intellectual I ever saw. He's the first scholar that ever showed me that being a scholar in academia does not mean that you have to lock yourself away from the community. Um, the first person I ever heard of that was a public scholar was Julianne Malvo, and I read her book, Sex, Lies, and Stereotypes. And you see Dr. Malvo comes on to this channel a lot. Uh, and Dyson uh, was the first one I ever saw. Cornell West was the first one I ever saw in person. I ever shook his hand and talked to him, right? So I, I give them credit for that, but I think there's room, and I'm sure that they would understand this, there's room to critique an idea if it's just a bad idea and to talk about what we see. And here's what I'm gonna say in terms of what I see, because y'all know I got to be honest. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, Bob, I'll take BS for a hundred dollars, please. Uh, I'll take BS for a for hundred bucks because I, I think B, I think that the idea um, I couldn't understand why the idea got on my nerves. Like it really annoyed me. Like I read it and I was like, I told Alicia, I said, this idea gets on my damn nerve and I don't know why. I don't know. I mean, you know, what's wrong with somebody being nice and doing charity? Like, and then what's wrong with white folks paying up, right? We know that they owe us, right? You know, okay. What's wrong with the guy cutting the grass and getting extra money? Why should I be offended by that? And what and I figured out I had to get in touch with my own emotions on why I felt this way. And the reason that I felt like it was BS is because the idea basically is a gimmick. You know, the idea is a gimmick. It's it's a it, it's catchy, it's it, it sound it sounds you know cool and intriguing. I can see some white university literally running off with this idea and 
you know, and, and it's something that white liberals would just think was just like brilliant and amazing. And, 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 and it's very insulting, I think, not that Dyson intended to be insulting to black people, but it's very insulting because you're kind of, you know, you're kind of taking a very serious issue and turning it into a charity based gimmick. Like, yeah, just, you know, tip the black waitress a little bit extra. I mean, I already do that. I don't know. Does anybody else do that when you go to a restaurant and you, you tip black people different from the way you tip white people? I ain't gonna lie. I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I might be, I might be systematically racist on this mug. Cause in, in my house, like we, we just kind of, we do the B1 philosophy, you know, black first, like type B1 in the chat. If you put black people first, like, like really I do. When I go to a restaurant, if the waiter or waitress is black, automatically in my mind, you're not getting 15%. You're getting 25. You're getting 30%. If you're a young brother that looks like you're working hard, trying to take care of your family, trying to become something, I might give you, I might tip you an amount that matches the cost of the entire meal, right? That's what I do. I just, I just, I, I do give that preference, but never in a million years would I ever think that that would replace the vast systemic multi-trillion dollar uh, debt that is owed to black people for reparations. Like never would I think that tipping black people a little bit more or paying the guy who cuts the grass a little bit more um, would be any sort of substitute for what really needs to happen. The, the serious heavy work that needs to be done. Uh, it's like it's like going to somebody who needs heart surgery and giving them a Kleenex. Like a Kleenex obviously does not replace heart surgery. Um, but a Kleenex is it's better than nothing, but it's not much better than nothing. And I think and I think Dyson gets this right. I really believe that he understands this. Um, now, he's not a professor of economics. He's a professor of sociology. But I think even as a professor of sociology, I imagine he even he would probably admit that he wasn't saying that this was all that was needed. I think he was saying, like, hey, this is something you could just do if that's something that'll make you feel better. But I think that be, that comes into like another little challenge that you have. Um, you know, in terms of Dyson's space in the world, I think he's in a space where he's probably conflicted. You know, he's probably very conflicted uh, because if you listen to Dyson's words very carefully, um, I, and I, I've heard the critiques, I've heard the good and the bad things about him. It, the good things, obviously, he's very, very smart, um, super sharp, eloquent, uh, charismatic. You know, he can do the damn thing. He's good at that. But the downside, unfortunately, is that a lot of people feel like he's doing a whole lot of talking and ain't nothing really happening. Nothing really. There's not not much substance underneath all the performance, right? That that uh, you know, unfortunately, he he can end up appearing to be the uh, scholarly version of a rapper. Like, well, you know, the and the the occlusive cover, but you're like, wow, that was a great song, right? But what, what did you learn? I don't know. I didn't understand half the words that were coming out of his mouth, and 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 he was talking in circles, right? You know, and 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 or if you you hear him sort of speak about, um, you know, a lot of things. It, 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 unfortunately, there's also that trap of when you are so ingrained in the celebrity culture, you know. I mean, he's he's really in there with the celebrities. He knows a lot of rappers and everything else. It, it can make it tough for you to really tell the truth about some of this shit that that we see in the community. You know, uh, he, he just wrote a book uh, about Jay-Z. I'm sure it's a very good book. Um, I, I ain't gonna lie, I probably won't read it because uh, I, I just, I have my opinion on Jay-Z. I just really am not, I, I, I don't, it's not that I can't see the value in that project. It's just, I just don't, it's not something that I, that really intrigues me as a, as a valuable use of my time. But at the same time, um, I think as a scholar, his right to sort of analyze Jay-Z as the cultural icon that he is, I think that's certainly appropriate. Um, I just don't really know exactly what his presence adds in terms of us really getting things done and moving forward as a community. And I, and, 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 but then again, I think the question becomes, you know, what is his obligation? You know, what is his obligation? And I, I remember uh, being somewhat confused. Uh, Dyson and I had a debate at Brown university. Uh, we did a debate at Brown about 10 years ago on hip hop and whether or not artists are responsible for their words. Um, you can find it on YouTube. It's out there on YouTube. And, um, and, and, and we had this debate and uh, and I wasn't the first choice. I was like the backup quarterback because actually he was supposed to debate Cornell West and Cornell West refused to debate Dyson. He was pissed off. I guess they got pissed off at each other over the Obama thing, which I thought was such a sad uh, party because I, I could tell both of them were friends. I talked to each of them for hours about the other one. I sat with Cornell for hours in New York City and he had a lot of negative things to say about Dyson. And then I sat, I saw Dyson at Brown. He had a lot of negative things to say about Cornell West. And each of them were giving me their side of the story. And I felt very bad because I don't think that they 
I, I think that that was a typical kind of a standard white supremacist divide and conquer. Uh, when the Obama administration came in, they carved a wedge in the middle of the black community. They brought some people in and embraced them and they froze some people out. And it caused this civil war where people who used to be friends were now enemies because they were either in on the in crowd or on the outer crowd. Right. So, um, you know, uh, long story short, uh, in that debate, I remember, you know, uh, debating Dyson was was interesting uh, because I really felt that he, he didn't have that ability to really be as honest about hip hop as, as I really wanted him to be. I felt like, you know, when <clears throat> when you got friends like Jay-Z and these other rappers and Nas and all these other people, it's going to be hard for you to really tell the truth about what hip hop has done to the black community. Right. It's going to be hard for you to really talk about um, the, 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 the overwhelming uh, community destruction that comes when you're allowing white racist uh, extreme capitalist corporations to mass market black self-destruction to our <clears throat> young men and young women. Right. Uh, you know, we know that that's there. We know that that's what's happening. And, uh, and I, and I think that, you know, and I respected and appreciated his uh, his view on, you know, creative freedom and the ability, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, things like that. But there's a limit to that. Right. Um, you know, the Jewish community is not going to let you use freedom of expression as an excuse to make music advocating for the mass extermination of the Jewish community. They would never allow you if you put the Jewish community's name in your mouth as an artist, they will put the smack down so fast on you. You will think you will wish you were never born. Uh, does anybody remember when Michael Jackson literally just mentioned had one word? I think he said "kike me" or something in the song, and and he wasn't even saying it in a disrespectful way. And they shut his ass down. I mean, one of the most powerful performers in the world. Jay Z said something about the Jews, like like very quick, very brief, nothing disrespectful. He was actually applauding the fact that they they're so good at amassing wealth, and they went in on his ass. They went on him on him hard, you know. And so um, I, I think that that so I think that that's where. I started feeling like, gosh, you know, I, I kind of feel like uh, sometimes this, um, you know, this, this celebrity culture or or also being the darling of the white liberal establishment um, can can really limit what you're able to really say as a black man. Uh, and and, and it's not to the point where I think I don't, I don't believe I'm, I'm telling you, those of you who think Dyson should be canceled. I don't agree with you. I don't think that we should look at somebody who's an older brother figure, an elder, whatever you want to call him, and just say you're worthless because your approach is not consistent with what we we define to be a better approach, you know, in 2019. Um, maybe he he worked for his time, and maybe he still has a place in this time, right? I think he does, right? Um, I just think that you got to know what it is, though. You got to know what it is and know what it's not, right? Uh, it is what it is, and it ain't what it ain't. And uh, and I'll tell you, um, uh, one thing that really just made me sad was uh, when Dyson was used by the Obama administration to do this massive 10,000 word hit piece on Cornell West. When Cornel West was making very valid critiques on the Obama administration and their inattention to the black community, black unemployment, poverty in the black community, the chaos and, and death and destruction in the black community. I mean, you had little kids being shot of two blocks from Obama's house in Chicago. And the Obama administration acted like that wasn't even happening. They did not care. And and and, and it's okay for you to say, okay, I don't agree with Cornell's approach, but for you to allow yourself to be used as a weapon of mass destruction where you're propped up by a white liberal establishment, white liberal media outlet to literally launch uh, nuclear missiles at uh, at a man that has done tremendous and wonderful and amazing work for the black community. That's not cool. That is not cool. And in, in fact, I think that was actually when I think Dyson was a little uncomfortable with my critique on that. And I think that was when we started kind of dividing a little bit as friends. And but it's not it's not it's not something where I feel like I don't like the guy. I still like the guy. I'm just saying, you know, your friends are the ones who should be telling you when you messed up. And uh, and I just think 10,000 words. I mean, did it really take 10,000 words for you to write all this and to really go out of your way to join the chorus of white folks who want to act like Cornell West never did anything good for anybody? I, I think that's crazy to me. You know, so so um, in fact, I would rather have those guys go into a back room and talk it out and figure out how they're going to coexist uh, without disrespecting and trying to destroy each other. But I guess people don't we don't operate on that code. You know, it's, it's a different kind of thing. So I'll say this. I'm not going to go out here and critique Dyson as a person. Um, he has a right to his approach, his style, doing what he does, the way he does it. Um, I would just say, though, that this idea of the individual reparations account, um, it just comes off a little weird. Uh, it comes off a little bit uh, silly. Um, it's, it's an idea I wish he'd never shared. Um, uh, it's an idea I wish at the very least he could have supplemented that idea. Um, and I also think 
that you know that that there's a there's a problem when we sort of have this whole thing where you've got the the white liberal uh, establishment, you know, where they sort of embrace certain uh, black people uh, to come, you know, and they do these speaking tours and they go into all these, you know, these, you know, these uh, liberal college campuses, and and it's sort of like you're sort of bringing a wokeness to the campus, but not really. You're bringing wokeness, but you're not really bringing true black empowerment to those spaces. Um, you're bringing sort of this weird integrationist ideology. And I, and I, I, I in fact, I've, I actually refer to it as the Holocaust of integration. You're celebrating the Holocaust of integration. Uh, and the reason it was the Holocaust of integration is because it led to the mass disintegration of black institutions and our ability to uh, exist as a strong and proud community. Uh, since the Holocaust of integration, uh, you've seen a disintegration in our commitment to uh, black education. Our kids are less well educated than they were before integration. Uh, since the Holocaust of integration, you've seen a, a, a complete destruction of the black family to the point where um, seeing complete black families with a mommy and a daddy and children living normal lives, that's extremely rare. We, we applaud when we see that happen because it is so rare. Um, the Holocaust of integration led to a complete disintegration of the black economic infrastructure and, and black businesses everywhere. Uh, and and, and you, you exchange your businesses for, for jobs. And, uh, and so to some extent, um, you know, I, I can't say that liberalism, black liberalism, I don't see that as a solution for black people. Uh, you know, we're not going to do better because we become gayer or because or we're not going to do better because we become more feminist. We're not going to do better, you know, because we're, we're, we're deeply concerned with illegal immigration and wanting to go, you know, protect kids on the border that, that are put in cages when we got 100,000 of our own people that have been put in cages and nobody's saying anything about that. Right. We're not going to. Uh, become freer by getting more jobs, right? We have to figure out what our formula for freedom is, and that's what we got to rock with. That's what we got to run with, right? And so ultimately, I think that, um, you know, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not a person who claims to know all the answers. I have all the solutions. I am not the most uh, articulate motherfucker on the block. I am not, uh, I, I don't have the most charisma out of all the people that are out here. I can't speak, you know, 100 miles an hour and make it rhyme and sound good the way Dyson does. And I certainly sure as fuck will never have a job at Georgetown University because they would fire me on my day off. Um, but I will say that, you know, I, I think a good measuring stick of ideas that are put on the table is whether those ideas can actually work. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that uh, that pushing uh, mass investment initiatives um, and investment revolution in the black community is something that can work. I think getting us all to become investors uh, and producers rather than consumers and spenders is something that will work. I, I, I believe that education, educating our own children uh, is, is what's going to work, not not getting caught up on the liberal bandwagon of creating better public schools because it's almost like creating nicer penitentiaries, like it, creating better public schools is uh, creating uh, you, you know, cleaner facilities for our brainwashing to occur. Um, I, public schools do not help black people. Uh, not only do they un leave them uneducated, but they also leave many of our children miseducated. And so uh, ultimately what happens is that you end up with a lot of these little white supremacists in blackface going through life thinking you're helping your community when really you're not helping your community at all because you got the wrong ideas from the beginning. You never learn from the beginning at all who you are, uh, you know, because you had 30,000 years of history before you even got to this country. Uh, you, you know, you got black kids that, are, that went to Harvard, Yale, Brown University who know more about George Washington than they know about Marcus Garvey. Um, you, you, you don't even understand the basics of what it takes to actually to build a nation and to develop in, in the, the type of infrastructure you need in order for you to be truly powerful. So you have a lot of elite and I know these people. I know these people because I was one of them. I, I was in that category. These highly educated black people. And I have a lot of education. I, I was in grad school. I finished grad school. I, was, I finished my PhD when I was 31 years old. Um, and, uh, and and I saw I what got me thinking was I started noticing all these educated black people who were supposed to be winning. And all they would do is sit around and complain about why they can't do what they want to do because white people won't let them. Or people that went to Harvard and are complaining because they don't have jobs, you know, or they can't pay the bills. You know, there, there's a video, actually, if you go to um, YouTube, there's a video uh, or, or something, a, a TED talk where this lady is a black lady. And she says, I have a Harvard MBA and I declare bankruptcy or I have a Harvard MBA and I have no money or I have a Harvard MBA and I can't pay the rent. It's something like that. And I'm like, OK, I don't I don't understand that. What? What? Huh? Right. So what that really says is that your solutions aren't working. And I really think that as black people, I think we got to really start sort of thinking about what our solutions are going to be. Um, so uh, let me just reiterate 
I am not in the business of trying to run around here saying Dyson ain't shit. That's just not what I'm interested in doing. In fact, if Mike ever wanted to come on my channel, y'all might not like that shit, but I will invite him in any day of the week. Uh, just like I told you guys, I would invite Bill Cosby. I didn't give a damn what people thought about that um, because I don't think that he's a worthless human being. I just think this is a very misguided idea. And uh, But when I think about kind of the the history of it all, of it all and, and sort of where his positioning is, you know, in terms of going to all these different universities on the speaker circuit and kind of speaking and writing books and working in Georgetown, what it is, is, is you, you know, you have this guy that, that is deeply embedded in the in this um, white supremacist economic system. And his position is that of the uh, of the black guy that white liberals love. Right. And white liberals are just as racist as many white conservatives. Actually, in fact, white liberals, um, Malcolm warned you about this. Malcolm talked about this all the time. White liberals uh, can be very fascist, uh, very oppressive in terms of even even uh, deciding what they're going to allow you to even talk about. Like you say something that they don't are they are comfortable with about LGBT. Oh, they'll shut your ass down. You come in and you say something that doesn't fit with, uh, you know, with what the Democratic Party has mandated. Oh, they'll shut your ass down. Uh, you know, and uh, and, and I, I really think that it's a, it's a problem when you're allowing blackness to be defined by whether you are liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican. They have no right to define whether or not you are an authentic black man or black woman. I know plenty of black people who are conservative, who are who will bang harder for black people than a lot of the liberals I know. In fact, not only will they bang harder for black people, but because they've embraced these ideas of 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 um, of, uh, of, of, of family structure, um, institution building, personal responsibility, they actually are far more empowered to elevate the community than a black liberal who's run around begging for a job because he got a degree from Brown University, right? So so, I, so I'm gonna say, you know, that, that we gotta sort of rethink the whole dialogue. I, I think there's a community we've, we've gotta grow in that regard. Um, uh, and in fact, actually part of that challenge, that contradiction pops up at the end of the New York Times interview. The guy makes a point, he, you know, so, so he says, you know, Okay, so you're you know you're saying that the um, uh, was he says, um, but charity can't be the end of it, right? And he's basically talking about Dyson's argument that we should have these individual uh, reparations accounts for white people, where they you know tip the tip the uh, the way the black waitress a little bit more, or pay the guy who cuts the grass uh, double or whatever. And he says, but charity can't be the end of it, right? And which we know that it shouldn't. Charity is not the solution. Investment is actually the solution. Um, he says, but the Koch brothers, the Koch brothers were these notorious conservatives who had billions of dollars, who funded lots of conservative causes. The Koch brothers gave the United Negro College Fund 25 million, but I doubt you would consider them woke. Uh, and he says, no, Martin Luther King believed that charity is a poor substitute for justice, but I ain't turning $25 million down. Now he's correct. The United Negro College Fund was right to take that money from the Koch brothers. I think that that was fine. I think it's fine to take that money no matter where it comes from, uh, assuming that you're okay with the terms, the trade-offs, right? When people give you money, they usually want something in return, assuming you're okay with that. Uh, but but I also think that that highlights that the, the challenge and the, a little bit of the hypocrisy, if you want to call it that, uh, where we sort of you know have this idea that liberal is black and conservative can't be black. You know, and, 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 I, and I almost look at it as, because you know, I talk to people, I talk to individual people. I have friends that are conservatives and I listen to them. And I will tell you, if you measure when I feel more oppressed, when I feel less free, I feel less free talking to liberals than I feel when I talk to conservatives. And the reason is that most of my conservative friends will hear me out. You know, if I have an idea that's different from theirs and I say, you know, black people should have our own, we should do this, we should do that, we should educate our own kids, blah, blah, blah. They'll hear all of that. And they, they, they're like, yeah, that sounds good. I'm, I like the fact I, I, I had on a shirt that said black gentrification when we buy up the block and own our own communities or something like that. And there was a conservative white guy who was like, I like that shirt, you know, and, and, he, and it was unsolicited, you know, whereas with with liberals, it's like this whole like policing of of, of, of what you believe. Like, oh, you're homophobic because you don't believe you believe girls and boys should use you know, different bathrooms or, or whatever, or, or you think the transgender stuff, uh, it, you know, you've made a comment critiquing the transgender movement. So you're homophobic, you're bad. I'm like, no, I just don't think that big muscular ass dudes who declare themselves to be women should be allowed to go and, you know, compete against girls in, 
track and field and rugby and shit. Like I, it doesn't make any sense. You go, you go, your women can't win anymore because you got dudes literally saying, "Oh, I think I want to be a girl now," and they're running with their big hairy balls and they're competing against women. Like that don't even make no damn sense. That's crazy. That's weird. That that's that's like mental illness. That you know, like that, that don't that what the fuck is this shit? You know, seriously. So I mean, so I think it's kind of like I like I I actually like the fact. I, I like it. I don't really think that black people. Um, I think we've got to get past this idea that we got to kind of that we kind of need white people to get on board with much of anything. I think that when you talk about the reparations debate, you can make it 100 percent abundantly clear. Look, y'all owe us about 15 trillion dollars. Um, this is not going to this problem is not going to be solved through charity or tipping the waitress or paying the, the guy who cuts your grass a little bit more. I'm sure Dyson would agree with this. I'm not even saying something I think he would disagree with because he's a smart man. Um, you know, you need to pay what you owe. Uh, if you're a Democratic Party politician and you want my vote, then pay what you owe. Uh, you want me to support whatever bullshit you bring into our table, then pay what you owe. Uh, you know, we've got things to do. Pay what you owe. And it, 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 it we're going to be building in the meantime because we, we know that you're probably not going to pay anytime soon. But if you ever want anything from us, uh, we're not your political whores. We're not your economic whores. We're, we expect reciprocity from what we give. If, we go, if we're going to support your business, then your business must be supporting our community. It's as basic as that. Uh, if, if you want us to support your politicians and vote for you, then you need to lay a black agenda on the table and it better be clear. It better be real because we got assholes out here like Dr. Boyce Watkins who will break that shit down into a molecular level and embarrass your ass and call you out on every ounce of your bullshit. You know, the days of sort of being able to go into urban neighborhoods and put some ghetto ratchet ass you know, add on the radio, like, girl, I'm going to go vote for Senator Mitchell called he, he, he lit. He going to be woke girl in the White House, girl. We going to get us some chicken. Girl. It's going to be good. Like all of that stuff. I think those days are gone because black people now actually have media spaces where we're able to connect with each other and call call out the BS and recognize what's real. So um, so I think that's that's the day that we're in. And I'm excited about that. And, uh, and, and last but not least, I will say, I just really hope that you guys aren't too hard on Dyson. I can't tell nobody what to say or what to do. And it's okay to disagree with me. If y'all want to feel a way, a certain way about it, you can. But I'm just going to say, you know, I, I, I think that the idea was misguided and incomplete. I would love for him to give a more complete analysis of what he's actually trying to say. I also think we need supplemental analysis where, again, I told you guys a lot of the reason that a lot of our economic strategies don't work is because we don't have actual economic experts laying those strategies out. If you recall, during the Obama presidency, uh, Obama, from what I understand, when he was trying to solve the black unemployment problem, allegedly, they never invited an economist to the White House. Julianne Malveaux was right there in D.C. She would have been glad to come to the White House. Uh, you had Dr. Claude Anderson right there in D.C. He would have been glad to drive over to the White House. But instead of inviting actual economists over or business owners over or wealth creators owner over, he invited Al Sharpton to the White House about 145,000 times, right? And Al Sharpton is not an economist. He is a preacher with a firm. You know, he should be there to give sermons. He should be able to be there to, to yap about civil rights, but he should not be there uh, giving economic advice to the president unless your goal is to create a plan that is going to fail, right? And that and that's something that I think is, is, is as basic as, as one plus one equals two. And maybe it's radical for me to say this. I don't think the truth is radical at all. I think the truth sets you free. And that's what I want to lean on in this whole conversation. We know what the solutions are. We just got to start implementing them. OK, guys. So uh, do me a favor. Please hit the thumbs up button. If you haven't hit the thumbs up button, please do that. I want to remind you guys uh, in terms of solving problems in your own family, your own community, you guys know the Black Business School is here for you. So uh, actually, tomorrow night, we're doing a, a really great seminar on uh, how to make money as a government contractor hosted by Walter Cotton, who's actually made millions and millions of dollars getting government contracts. So you're talking about getting a start on your reparations. Let's just be keeping 100. There's a lot of money in these government contracts that we're not claiming because a lot of us don't even know how to fill out the paperwork. So uh, somebody brought this to my attention uh, because our goal is to actually solve real economic problems for black people, not just to make you feel educated. We want you to actually have the things you need. And so uh, we reached out and we got a few people in there um, 
Walter Cotton, and there was a sister named Mary. I don't have her last name in front of me, uh, but she came on the Black Financial Channel. And this sister has literally, literally gotten billion dollar contracts from the government. I think one of the contracts they were talking about was 900 million, but I think she's actually done more than that. They, my brother said, I didn't even say a bill over a billion because black people wouldn't have believed us. They would have thought we were just making it up. But but there are people out there that are doing the damn thing, that are getting it done. So uh, these are your professors. These are the people you can learn from. So if you're interested in coming to the event, it's gonna be tomorrow night. We're, we have a few more slots left. We're almost sold out. But if you'd like to come to that event, please go to drboyceseminars.com. That's drboyceseminars.com. And I want to say thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pierre Louise, who always comes in and uh, donates in the super chat. And what I'd like to do for Dr. Pierre Louise is I like to mention Dr. Pierre Louise's book on Amazon. You should all check out. It's called From Extreme Poverty to Success. From Extreme Poverty to Success. You're a very smart man. Well, by the time we're done, everybody, a lot of people are going to know about your book because I have about 100,000 people a day that watch my YouTube channels. And I think it's very intelligent of you to donate in the Super Chat because when you give to the Super Chat, I always mention your comment. And that's a good way to promote your business. So this is me just sharing a little game with you guys that are looking for marketing and things like that. Um, uh, last but not least, um, I'll be in Ghana this week. I'm going to leave on Friday. I'll get there Saturday. Uh, I will tell you guys what I see. And, uh, and and you can kind of make of it as you wish. If I see anything interesting in terms of business, I'll explore it carefully and then bring it to you guys if it's something that I think the community can benefit from. And uh, also, I had a good conversation with the director of Tierra K.J. Williams yesterday. Uh, we're, one of the next installments of the Black Love Blueprint series where we're actually uh, helping black folks learn how to create solid relationships uh, because relationships are an important part of wealth building. If you can't maintain relationships, you can't build wealth. Most businesses done with people you have a relationship with. That's why we're doing the Black Love Blueprint series. Uh, the next step is um, Tierra actually found uh, a, a group of black couples that have been married over 30 years. And she's going to profile a lot of these couples uh, in a Black Love Blueprint series. And I told her it was a great idea, great project. So that's going to be the next release of Voice Watkins Films. It's going to be some stuff from the Black Love Blueprint. And I'll tell you guys about that later. And I want to give a shout out to Jabari Natour. I see you in there. Uh, Jabari's a great activist out of Philadelphia and a really good brother. And director Marcus Small is in here. His film is called The Melanin Code. If you have not seen The Melanin Code, you must go see, you must look up that film. It is extremely good. Uh, it's right there, right up there with Hidden Colors. You know, no shade at all to Tariq. You all know how great Hidden Colors is. But I'm going to tell you, like, we need a thousand movies like that, not just one or two. And Marcus Small is a young director that's really doing the damn thing. And so go check out The Melanin Code. It's extremely good. Uh, so anyway, guys, I'm out of here. Please hit the thumbs up button before you go. Love you. And don't forget, also subscribe to Black Enough. That's our social media platform. Here's how you spell it. It's on my shirt. So if you're Black Enough, join Black Enough. Uh, so have a good day, guys. I will see you soon, and I'll talk to you later. Peace.